here in Daniel chapter 11, so far God has shown us the future of certain nations which has already come to pass. In fact, everything in this chapter up to verse 36 has already happened. And some unbelievers have complained that it's too perfect and that somebody had to have written after the fact so that it would look like a real prophecy. But the problem is, when they get to verse 36, they say, oops, the guy that wrote this made a mistake because none of it ever happened. And we're looking at the fact that everything in Daniel 11 up to verse 35 has been fulfilled. And what happens after, <clears throat> from verse 36 on, has yet to be fulfilled. And what has already been fulfilled is the promise that the rest is going to be fulfilled. And so far, what God has shown is the future of Persia, of Greece, and of two kingdoms that emerged from the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire. And it's referred here, the king of the north, the king of the south. We've seen how after all this history, kind of focuses down to a conflict between these two kings. And now, from verse 21 to verse 35, we're shown the history of one king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, in 14 verses. Now, you know, I noticed that Alexander the Great gets one verse. The kings of Persia get one verse. And then about 20 verses for five kings of the south, five kings of the north, an average of two verses per person. But when we get to this one king of the north, we have 14 verses. And one of the rules of interpretation is that whatever is given a lot of space Obviously, the writer wants to emphasize what's going on there. So this person turns out to be the focus. And then in verse 36, those qualities are then focused on somebody who's yet to come. So what we have here in these scriptures is a certain person who has qualities that God wants to call our attention to. He exemplifies not good, but evil. And it's a simple sort of principle going on here. And it's right there in verse 36, then the king shall do according to his own will. These qualities that Antiochus IV Epiphanes exemplifies is what the Antichrist is going to exemplify turned up to 11, 15, 40. So we're going to look and see what kind of a guy ultimately the Antichrist is going to be, but we're also going to see who are the kind of people that resist and stand firm and are not conquered. So let's read these verses here, beginning from verse 21. It says here, And in his place shall arise a vile person, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers." He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches, 
and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. And his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. So, this person, this next king of the north, and it would be called the Seleucid Empire, the largest part of the lands when Alexander the Great died and his generals began scrambling for position and power and authority and dominion. The descendants of the general Seleucus ended up with the largest portion from the Middle East over to India. And this is uh, the next king. His name is Antiochus IV. And his title that he actually gave himself is Epiphanes, which means manifest. He considered himself to be the god Zeus, revealed. And so the first thing that's said about him is that he is a vile person. Now this has to be outstanding because all of these kings are vile. Every last single one of them. You think, well, what else is new? But this is a vile person. Outstandingly vile. Does everybody have this? So what is a vile person? When you despise someone, you regard him as negligible, worthless, distasteful. Got that? Just a nobody jerk. Now, that kind of a person tends to regard everybody else exactly the same and treat them the same. So, Antiochus IV regards everyone as negligible. That means worth nothing, worthless, distasteful, blech. He regards everybody like that except himself. Himself, he exalts and calls himself Zeus Epiphanes. I'm God, you guys are scum. Now, just funny enough, I was scooting around in my dictionary looking for the meanings of these words, and I looked at the antonym for what vile is. And these kind of descriptions. And you know what the dictionary says the opposite is? Love. Now you know God is love. God actually puts others before himself and he regards them <coughs> above his own self. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, trusts in him, relies on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God is love, he gives, and he gives greatly, and he gives life. Well, this is in the opposite direction. We don't have love here. You could not accuse Antiochus of loving anybody but himself. And so we're going to see here the opposite of love because he's a vile person. Now, it says he's a person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty. He was sort of in line for the succession for the throne, but he wasn't the main person in line. He was related to Seleucus IV, the previous king. He was his brother. But the new king was Seleucus' baby son, Antiochus V. 
So, what Antiochus IV did was he came in peaceably. In fact, he got himself appointed to be the guardian of this baby king. And he guarded him so well that he had a guy murder the baby and also murder the Jewish high priest Onias III. And then he had the murderer killed. What this did was it allowed him to take over the kingdom and also to begin a process of changing Israel to be what he wanted Israel to be. He wasn't in favor of the Jews continuing their own religion. He wanted a unified kingdom because when he came to the kingdom, of course, there's all kind of different people. And he wanted to kind of straighten everybody out, smooth everybody out, have a nice, efficient empire where everybody's thinking the like and they're all on the same page. So he wanted to make everybody think like a Greek, as he himself was influenced by Alexander the Great. Now, the Greek name for Greece in those days was Hellas. And this process of making everybody think like a Greek is called Hellenization. All right, that's the technical word for it, just so you don't think I'm somehow talking about hell or something like that. All right, this is the idea of making everybody think according to the lines of Greek philosophy, Greek religion, Greek culture, Greek language, kind of homogenize everybody and make everybody hang together instead of all these tribal cultural differences that make it like, hey, I don't want to play along with you. Antiochus said, everybody is going to play along with me. So he became king in a time of peace with a small group of people with him. In verse 24, what he did was plunder his own kingdom. He used money to bribe people to make them go along with him, become stronger. And he was also in a mood to accept bribes. So when Onias III's brother Jason offered him money to become the new high priest, he took it. Jason was the high bidder. Actually, Jason's real name was Yeshua, Joshua. But he took the name Jason because it was Greek and it was cool. There was a movement at this point of, in the Jewish communities to go towards being like everybody else. This is one of the things that kind of dogs Israel throughout their whole history. That they say, well, we want to be like all the other nations. You know, it's interesting in Ezekiel, God says, what you have in your heart is never going to happen. You are never going to be like all the other nations. Well, so Jason offers Antiochus IV a lot of money to become the high priest. He says, boom, you're in. And then in a couple of years after that, another fella wanted to be the high priest, a Jew named Menelaus. That's a good Greek name. He offered 300 talents more than Jason did. And Antiochus really wanted Menelaus because Menelaus wasn't even of the tribe of Levi. He was from Benjamin. And you couldn't have priests from any other tribe than Levi. And Antiochus said, this is great. Menelaus said, I'm going to really lay down Greek culture. And Antiochus said, you're the man. Go for it. So that's what's happening in Israel. Now, it says in verse 25, he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. The king down there in Egypt was Ptolemy the sixth, and he was underage. He had two advisors who says, you know what? 
Your uncle Antiochus the fourth here is getting a little arrogant and a little antagonistic, and we need to go and take him. So Ptolemy the sixth was getting an army together, and Antiochus the fourth saw that and said, I'm going to nip this one in the bud. So he did what neither his father nor any of his ancestors did. He invaded Egypt, and he conquered Egypt. And he called himself the king of Egypt, and he plundered Egypt of its treasures. So, that's verse 28, returning to his land with great riches. He completely plundered Egypt. And it says in verse 26, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. This is talking about the king of the south. Those two advisors were the ones who put Ptolemy the sixth up to trying to invade his uncle, and it actually worked against him. So, Antiochus IV figured, I'll keep these guys from ever causing me problems. So he made, Anti uh, he made Ptolemy VI king of one Egyptian city called Memphis, and he made his younger brother Ptolemy VII king of Alexandria. You don't have to keep the name straight. All it meant was these two brothers started picking on each other, and Antiochus figured they wouldn't bother him anymore. So that keeps Egypt weak and out of my hair. Their ambitions kept them fighting with each other. And it says here in verse 27, both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. And you think, well, how could it be otherwise? Of course they want to lie to the other, deceive the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but... It's all going to be rather futile. It will not prosper. The end will still be at the appointed time. And you know, God's in charge of that appointed end. He's the one who says, now is the time. Whatever else anybody else does to grab power, maintain power, enlarge power, it's really going to be quite futile. Now, Verse 28, while returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. Right after he put Ptolemy sixth and seventh on the thrones and set them fighting each other, he heard a rumor that somebody was saying in Israel that he had died, and everybody was using that as a chance to dance on his grave and start splitting up his kingdom. So Antiochus IV comes back from Egypt and he just invaded Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and it says that he killed 80,000 Jews at this time. He plundered the temple itself, took out the candlestick, the golden table for the showbread, anything that was valuable, he plundered it. So, he returned to his own land. Then at verse 29, at the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and shall regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Here's what happened. Ptolemy the sixth and Ptolemy the seventh decided to make friends and unite against their uncle. And Antiochus IV could not have a strong Egypt. So he gathered his forces and he went down to evade them. And he was about to attack Alexandria. And the Romans showed up. The commander of the Romans said to Antiochus IV, the Senate of Rome says to stop this and go home. 
Antiochus first this said, I'll think about it, hoping to buy time. And the tribune, the Roman tribune, he took a stick, and they were on the beach, and he walked around Antiochus with the stick, and he drew a circle around Antiochus. And he said, the Senate says, make your decision before you leave this circle. And Tychus IV did not want to mess with Rome. They were unstoppable, and if you went up against Rome, you were dead. So there he was inside this circle, and he had to give his answer. So he said, okay, and go home. But he was furious. He was absolutely enraged. And this was not a good frame of mind. So Antiochus IV has to turn around and go back, but he decided, I am going to make Israel a buffer state between me and what Rome wants to do in Egypt. And he's thinking, I just want a bunch of people who think like I do. I don't want anybody telling me, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. He wasn't reacting very well to Rome telling him he could not invade Egypt and do what he wanted to do. Again, this is this idea of the king shall do according to his own will. And here's someone he could not mess with said, you can't do this. It gave him what the Germans call a thick neck. That's idiomatic German for he just got so angry. <laughs> and his neck gets really thick, you know. That's the way the Germans would call it. So he goes back to Israel with a thick neck, and he's going to straighten out these Jews once and for all. So he says, it says here, he's going to be moved against the Holy Covenant because all this being Jewish is, they're not obeying him. That's all it means to him. So here's what Antiochus IV did. He prohibited the worship of God. He prohibited sacrifices. He prohibited circumcision, which is what every Jew is supposed to do to their male child eight days after they're born. It's the sign of the covenant. And if you don't have that sign of the covenant in your flesh, then you are not belonging to God. He says, that's out. Anybody who has a copy of the scriptures is put to death, and he burns the scriptures. Then he comes to the temple, and he puts up an altar over the altar of God, and he dedicates it to Olympian Zeus. And he has swine sacrificed on the altar, and on the 25th, there's always a swine offered because that's his birthday and because he is Zeus manifest. He wants that celebrated in no uncertain terms. So this is something that is essential also to the Antichrist is he's going to stamp out all other worship and have it all directed toward himself. Now, it says here in verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. Again, he was promoting this Greek philosophy, Greek religion, Greek language, culture, everything so that Everything would be nice and uniform. Nice and unified. And if we have to stamp out being Jewish, hey, that, that's just the way it has to be. And of course, the abomination of desolation there in verse 31, that is sacrifice to another God in the temple of God. That's the abomination, the gross thing that makes it kills, it destroys. 
So, he's corrupting. He's out to just totally wipe being Jewish from existence. And this was the case in these times. This actually happened. But then it says in verse 32, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help. But many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Antiochus IV did not get his own way again. Because what happened is there were Jews that did not become Greek. They did not abandon their relationship with God. And they were led by um, Mattathias. You could pronounce it better than me. Matatio. So he was a Jew who just said, no way, we are not going to sacrifice. Now, what Antiochus did was appoint government representatives to come to every village, every city, and say, okay, we're all going to sacrifice now to Antiochus IV. And Matatiu said, no way. And when one Jew actually went forward to do it, he killed that Jew. Then he turned around and killed the imperial officer who was overseeing these things. And he said, everybody who's for God, come with me. And they went off into the wilderness, the forest. They organized, and then they sought God. They prayed, they fasted, they tore their garments, sackcloth, ashes, and mourning, and they sought God. And they asked God to help them. They also prepared for battle according to Deuteronomy chapter 20, the very instructions God gave so that every time they went out, they would be successful. And that's what happened. They started to fight against Antiochus IV's men. And every time they beat them, larger forces, larger forces, up to 10 times the amount of soldiers that they had. And this is written in, in uh, 1 Maccabees. Judas' people, Judas Maccabeus, that was Mattatio's son. And they asked, how can we, few as we are, fight against so great and so strong a multitude? And we are faint, for we have eaten nothing today. And Judas replies, It is easy for many to be hemmed in by few, for in the sight of heaven there is no difference between saving by many or by few. It is not on the size of the army that victory in battle depends, but strength comes from heaven. They come against us in great insolence and lawlessness to destroy us and our wives and our children and to despoil us. But we fight for our lives and our laws. He himself will crush them before us. As for you, do not be afraid of them. And they would fight against much larger and better prepared forces and defeat them until Antiochus IV gave the command to two of his generals to completely wipe out the Jews. He says, I want you to wipe out the memory of them from that place. Destroy them. This is the annihilation of the Jewish nation. And again and again, Judas' smaller force defeated Antiochus IV's men. And eventually, Judas and his men fought until they reached Jerusalem. They cleansed the temple, and they rededicated the temple. 
And this is where they knew they did not have enough olive oil to keep the lampstand in the temple burning. And part of that is the, the lampstand is never to go out, ever. What that symbolizes is that God is the light of the world. And part of the high priest's job is to keep those lamps trimmed and burning. Well, they didn't have enough olive oil to keep it going. And they prayed, and God somehow provided so that those lights did not go out for eight days. Now, this is when Hanukkah, again, I'm not saying it right, but I don't have enough in me. <laughs> Hanukkah was instituted, the Feast of Dedication. So, those who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits, but notice also that it ultimately it's not going to be successful. That's a hard one to take, isn't it? Because in verse 33 it says, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame. God is saying, ultimately, this is not going to be successful. And it says, some of those under, of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time in the end, because it is still for the appointed time. As much as it may have looked like the end of the world, the end of the Jewish nation, and it's fight or die, it wasn't. But it was meant to refine and purify God's people. You think, well, hmm, this is not very encouraging in one way. You mean we're not going to win. And there are two parts to this battle. Yes, there is an earthly battle going on. And there are people who are opposed to God, there's going to be ultimately the Antichrist who will oppose everything that stands up for God. And yet, this life is not all there is. And that's what gave Matteo, Judas, the forces with them, the courage to stand up against greater forces, better equipped. You know, they were all tempted to say, this is crazy. All we have to do is just offer sacrifice, say, God bless Antiochus IV, and all the pressure's off. But they said, you know what? It's better to die for what is right than to live for what is wrong. And Antiochus IV is not God. The end. We are prepared to be witnesses with our lives. Now, you know, that's the kind of attitude that God is going to bless. But what happened to the Maccabean revolt is that there were those who joined it in hypocrisy, with intrigue. And intrigue and ambition just means well, I'll go along with somebody who's winning so I can win too, because I want to win. It's not about living for God. It's about what can I get out of this? In other words, the same attitude as Antiochus IV. I want to do what I want. I want to do what pleases me. I want power. I want ambition. I want to satisfy myself. And if I don't get it, I'm going to be enraged. So some joined this revolt out of sheer ambition and corrupted the movement, turned the movement actually into something no different than Antiochus IV. So that's what happened. All right, what do we make of it? Because there's no way we can finish the chapter today. I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. You're shaking your head no, and I totally understand that. It's a lot of history. So we're not there yet, and we leave on kind of a tough note, don't we? We don't like to hear about 
Ah, a little bit of victory, but kind of a lot of defeat. What I want to emphasize here is that we are also in this kind of a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And what strikes me the most about these spiritual forces of wickedness is that they refuse to give in. We've noted this before from uh, Daniel chapter 10, where one angelic being can battle against another angelic being for 21 days, and neither one of them is going to give in. And these authorities, these principalities and powers that the Bible talks about, this Ephesians 6, they rule over the whole earth. They have their territories. And they refuse to budge. They're going to hold and they're going to extend their power and because of that there is, for lack of a better word, an anti-Christian movement. That's what we find ourselves in right now today in England. The whole current of the culture is against Jesus Christ. And you can tell somebody about Jesus on your job and lose your job for that. If that person decides, hey, this person is telling me something I don't want to hear, they can go and say, this guy was oppressing me. And that's it. You're out. So here we are in the midst of this vast current going the other way. And it's easy to avoid the pressure. You just don't stick up for Jesus. Keep your mouth shut on the job. Don't do anything that might offend somebody else. And there's a lot of pressure to do that, isn't there? Do you feel it? You know, you don't have to have a tough day. Just keep your mouth shut and go through your job and everything's going to be great. But here's the problem. If you want to be somebody who belongs to God, then by the, by the very nature of that, you're going to be somebody who declares God's praise and his excellency. That's just part of it. Because he's the very best. And what do you talk about when you're happy? <coughs> that person, that very thing that makes you happy. So you're going to talk about it. But that might bug somebody else. Difficult, isn't it? Well, what do you do? It's those who know their God who shall be strong and carry out great exploits. You know that God still wants to do great exploits today? And I don't think he wants us to live in fear. What's going to happen if I open my mouth here? What's going to happen if I do what's right here? I better just be like everybody else and then there won't be any problems. But see, that's just something that seals your mouth and ties your hands and you live in the fear of death. God does not want us to live in fear anymore. And yes, those principalities, those spiritual beings, they're wicked, and they want us to just be quiet, and they're the ones that are not going to budge. Here is the nature of our warfare, is to pray and to know God and to not move ourselves. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, exhorts us to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And you know, it's a chapter about the resurrection. Why are we not afraid to die? Why are we not afraid to go to court? Why are we not afraid to live openly for Jesus? Because the worst they can do is kill us. 
And that's it. So, we have to be those who hold on to that. Just like Judas told his men, you know, it's better to die for doing what is right than to live for what is wrong. And so, those who know their God shall be strong. That's really the most important thing is to know God, to know like Judas told his men. He reminded them specifically about one incident in the Old Testament about Saul's son Jonathan and his armor bearer and how Jonathan says, you know what, let's just go out to those Philistines because you know the Lord isn't restrained to save by many. He can save by few. And his armor bearer says, hey, I feel the exact same way. Let's go do it. Two guys go up to the camp. And Jonathan says, this is our signal. If we yell out to them and they say, you wait, we're coming down to you, we're not going to go up. But if they say, oh, come on up here, we'll show you something, that's our signal. That's because no sentry in his right mind would say to the enemy, oh yeah, come on up. That's dumb. He says, if they're that dumb, we're going to take them. So they show themselves to the Philistines, and the guard says, hey, come on up and we'll show you something. Jonathan says, we got them. And he goes up there, and he starts whacking away at the Philistines. And he wounded about 20 of them within about an acre of ground, it says there. And you know what his armor bearer did? He's not a big hero like Jonathan, but he can stab him. So he went around and killed all the ones that got hurt, see? They, they complemented one another very well. So they slaughtered about 20 of them, and it got the entire camp of the Philistines upset. Everybody's going, what's going on? And they started whacking away at each other. Israel camped across the valley, started attacking. I mean, they turned the whole thing around. Two guys. So you know, God's the same. Yesterday, today, forever. And it doesn't take many people. It doesn't take a very large church. But it does take a church of people who are not afraid to die. And you're not afraid to die because you know this is not it. I have a hope of eternal life right now. And I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. If I get shot with a bullet in Nigeria, I'm going to be with the Lord. And if I have job problems here, I'm going to be with the Lord. And either way, God is with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Those who know their God are going to be strong. So this is the challenge, is to first of all know God and be convinced that nothing's going to happen to you. Jesus said, not a hair on your head is going to get lost. You're laughing at me. Don't laugh at me. What he meant was, I get it all back. Not a hair on your head is going to be lost. Even if we die, even if we go to jail, even if, you know, one of those Christian legal organizations don't want to take our case on and we get utterly wiped out, I mean, think about the worst and then think, you know what? This life is this short. It's temporary. We are living for the next life. So, you know why Judas and those guys won over larger numbers? Because they had a more excellent spirit within them. And they knew what they were fighting for. 
The other guys are just fighting so they can collect spoils and slaves. In fact, the first time they faced off with uh, Judas and his group, all these slave traders came with and Antiochus's men because they figured, hey, we're going to get a bunch of slaves now. So they were just waiting so they could buy cheap slaves. And what happened was Judas won. Well, I, I just read this in a history of Israel. In the War of Independence, 1948, the Arabs were attacking one village called Negba. And the Israelis were vastly outnumbered and they held the city. And later on, some Egyptians got captured in battle, and their commander, captured commander, just said, how did you guys defend Negba? We couldn't understand it. We lobbed 4,000 shells into that city. Half you guys were out. How did you defend Negba? And the answer was, we knew what we were fighting for, and you guys don't. It's the same exact answer. That blew my mind. So I'm going to ask you, do you know what you're fighting for? You are fighting for the honor of God and your own life. And you don't want to be quieted, shut up, made like everybody else. You want to declare forth God's praises and honor the name of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have the name above all names. And we realize we're in a battle that we did not really ask for. And our temptation is to say, I don't want to fight. And yet here we are. If we don't fight, we're going to die. And so we look to you now. And we say, Lord, put your excellent Holy Spirit within us. And help us to rise up and do great exploits because we know you. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Help us be those not afraid to die. If anybody hasn't received Jesus, now's the time to do it. Now is the acceptable time, the day of salvation, to trust that Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the dead. And we want to open up our hearts and receive. You come into our lives, Lord. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. 